was that they're all leaders. They're all American leaders. And some are overt, extroverted leaders. Some are kind of quiet and subtle leaders. We've all probably heard of most of them, but we don't really know what it is exactly that they did. So we're not going to do a, a biography. We're going to focus on the decisions that they made. And I had the idea for this um, literally at Mount Rushmore last summer, sitting there and, you know, late in the afternoon. And my wife said that Mount Rushmore was terrible. She's like, oh, you can't even get close. And it's still, I'm like, we were there in like, 1979, so like, I'm sure it's changed a little bit. And I tell you, I'd never been there before, and it was fabulous with a brand new walkway that literally takes you almost under the noses of the president. So you can get right up to him. And I'm standing there wearing my It's Okay, I'm an American t shirt, and I'm like, oh man, this is great here. You said it was terrible. And this guy starts looking at me. He's like, what is wrong with you, buddy? And I start talking to him. And it turns out he's from Greensboro, North Carolina. He was part of the uh, Teacher Ranger program many years ago. He retired. Now he hangs out in South Dakota. And he's like, Chapel Hill, do you know Ron Olson? And I'm like, how do I answer that question? I'm like, yeah, he's up there on the mountain. I know him really well. And apparently he was... Um, uh, cross country coach that ran the Wendy's Invitational for like years and years and years. So he was like, oh my God. So he went gaga and, and did all this behind the scenes stuff for us. But he did a presentation at night where he lit up each president's face with the spotlight and gave like a five to six minute, like I was just telling my best Taylor Gillen story. I was it anyway. So, right. um, and he focused, he called the guys on Mount Rushmore, Foundation Expansion, Preservation, and Development. I was like, oh, dear, write that down. Because clearly I don't have you know, anything to write with. That would be a perfect lecture series topic. So I put it this week because Monday was supposed to be President's Day and all the snow. So here goes, why are, it, are these four guys on Mount Rushmore? We all know they're presidents. But what exactly did they do? Why are they leaders? Some of their decisions were not very popular, um, but they did them anyway. And for me, that's a, a true test of a leader. When you know what is right, even though there are a bunch of naysayers, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and you know it's the right thing, and you go ahead and do it anyway. And that's what puts these guys up here. So, um, hey, hey. Um, Mount Rushmore is called President's Mountain. Its location is unique. We're going to do a little Mount Rushmore history first. South Dakota. Who goes to South Dakota? What is in South Dakota? I said the same thing until I went there. Badlands, you ever meet? Just gorgeous. And there's nobody there. And then there's Mount Rushmore. And then there's like Deadwood and like cool stuff. And it's all within like 20 miles. Anyway, um, Gutzon Borglum dedicates Mount Rushmore. 1941, um, right at the beginning of World War II, and when asked why he picked these four presidents, he goes, because they perfectly sum up in my mind, in my artist's mind, 150 years of American hi history. The only break Borglum took in making Mount Rushmore is he took a two-year break to build the North Carolina 26th Monument in Gettysburg out of black marble. So he made that. Um, just about a, a billion dollars, $989 million, 992 $0.32 cents to the exact penny. <laughs> no, I don't budget. it. Somebody was an accountant. And it takes 14 years and 400 guys to complete. And each president is 60 feet tall. And Washington is first up. Looking at it, he's on the far left. He represents the birth of, of our country. To his left is kind of a weird looking knoll. That was supposed to be Jefferson. But that's the one mistake they made on a cold winter morning. It was a little bit too cold. They used a little bit too much dynamite. And Jefferson blew up. So they're like, oh boy. What are we going to do now? So they had to move him to the right, and that's why Roosevelt is kind of back in that notch. 
because the first Jefferson blew up. Sorry, Thomas. Um, uh, Jefferson is expansion, a little bit we touched on last week. Lincoln is preservation. And then Roosevelt's a guy, not many, but what did, what did he do? He is, um, uh, talk about his antitrust, he's development, economic development and westward development of the United States. And when asked why this place was picked, Borglum said it's because where the Great Plains, is the, he saw it as the far-reaching, in the artist's perspective sometimes amaze me, the Great Plains were America's far-reaching vision towards the future in the West, and the mountains, the low black hills, were some of the obstacles we had to cross to get there. So he thought it was a perfect junction to build um, Mount Rushmore. So this over here is the first Jefferson, and the only sign of any machinery is just above Washington's left eye and the eyebrow, a giant jackhammer drill bit broke. And they can't yank it out or it will break his eye. So other than that, um, there are the, the presidents. You can get real, like almost um, right up next to them on, on a little walkway. And this was at sunset just before the um, presentation was made. And it was absolutely fantastic. And if you stay, you get one free scoop and cone of Thomas Jefferson's vanilla bean ice cream from Monticello. So as a little ad -in. So who's going to turn down free ice cream? So anyway, first up is Washington. He's a biggie. We all know a little bit about Washington. President, general, some, some of that stuff. Um, born February um, 22nd, 1732, to an upper middle class family. You know, and their backgrounds are very important. It kind of speaks to who these guys were. When he's 11, his father dies, and so he you know, hangs out with and is influenced by his older brother Lawrence and one of his dad's buddies who happened to be the very rich Lord Thomas Fairfax, who was a British royal agent and very rich guy in Virginia. And young George hung out with those two and George will spend most of his time in what is today Fredericksburg at the Stafford Custis House. It is on the far side of Fredericksburg um, from uh, downtown Fredericksburg over the Rappahannock River. The Stafford House, which plays a large part of the Civil War, is where he hung out. And that's where he supposedly threw the silver dollar across the, the Rappahannock. But that is Washington's boyhood home. And his father's death kept him from getting educated in England, which is what middle class people did. You send your children back to England to get educated. But your father had to be alive. When George's dad dies, he loses that opportunity. So he can't get known in England. He can't rub elbows with you know, the aristocracy and upper middle class of, of, of England. So he's stuck. But his connections to the Fairfax family helps him out, and he gets a job as a surveyor for Culpeper County. A surveyor is a pretty interesting job, you know, drawing straight lines and property lines and mapping out trails. And Washington was uncannily good at it. He was a good woodsman. Terrain made sense to him. He was kind of fearless. He was much bigger and stronger than anybody around. He was well over six feet. And so he loves it. So he set off into the remoteness of the wilderness. Western Virginia, West Virginia, parts of Pennsylvania, and Ohio. For the Ohio Company, which was a large investment firm that the British owned. What is out there? What can we have? Are there any roads? And you've got to remember at this time, there are no roads leading west. Right? There's, there's nothing. So Washington is going to plot our trail westward. Um, 1751, uh, he has to go to Barbados with his older brother Lawrence. And Washington's uh, map making skills catch the eye of a um, Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie. So his hard work and his accuracy pays off. There is a road, um, it's Route 224, it runs from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Indianapolis, Indiana. Now Washington um, started it in Pittsburgh and he got a little past what is today Columbus, Ohio. 
Airline pilots use it as a landmark when they're in the air flying over the Midwest because from Pittsburgh past Columbus, it deviates from being arrow straight by less than 12 inches, like a perfectly straight road that he surveyed through the wilderness moving out there. So he has to go to Barbados with his brother, warm up in the Caribbean a little bit. His brother had tuberculosis. They were hoping the climate would help him out. But Lawrence dies. And on top of Lawrence dying, Washington gets smallpox. And he almost dies. But he shakes it off. And that is important because he learns the importance of inoculation. And this will come back uh, to a big decision in the uh, Revolutionary War. So, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of artifacts and primary documents. So we've got to settle for a, a painting. Here's big red-haired George Washington, big tall stallion, surveying out in the middle of the Allegheny Mountains, making his arrow straight road. And uh, with Lawrence's death, there's a, there's a job opening. Lawrence was the main Virginia militia commander. He was very good at it. And Governor Dinwiddie here says, well, you know, it's a pretty big job for any one guy, so I'm going to split it up into fourths. And one of the fourths I'm giving to George. George, you have to prove yourself. And the British were looking to expand in the Ohio Territory. George had been there. He had explored it. He knew it. So in 753, he is sent by the crown to kick the French out of the Ohio country, get them out of the Ohio River. This is English territory. They can't have it. So this is a conflict that we're going to know as the French and Indian War, and in Europe it's known as the Seven Years' War, and Washington pretty much starts it. He's involved from the very beginning, and if he didn't do it, one of his personal aides does happen to start the war. Um, Washington is sent to tell the French, get out of the Ohio River Valley. Just get out. This is ours. You can't have it. And he meets with an Iroquois war chief known as Half King. And the Crown wanted to have some Native American allies in case the French had a large armed company, and if they had other Native American allies. So we want loyal British Iroquois with us. Washington delivers a letter to the French, and they say, no, no, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> All right. So Washington takes the rejection letter back. And on the way out, he keeps this very interesting diary, talking about his feelings, his kind of hopes, his concerns, what he felt was his duty. He describes the terrain and the meeting with French. The French, it's a really good short story. Governor Dinwiddie says, publish that thing. So he does. And it turns out to sell like hotcakes. Everybody thought this was a great story, so it helps his name become known, and it helps start his military career. Here's a guy who's a little bit nervous and afraid, but he says, it is my job, it is my duty, so I'm going to buck up the courage, and I'm going to walk into the French camp, and I'm going to tell him to go. So he does it. So what happens? Well, Washington is told, all right, they said no, you got to go back and you got to kick out the French. You've got to protect our workers building a fort in what is today Pittsburgh. Now, if you ever go to Pittsburgh or you see like a Steeler game, there's a big fountain of the Golden Triangle where all three rivers meet. Part of the fort is still there. It's, it'll fit in this room. It's not that big, but it's still there. But the French beat Washington to it. And the French kick out the um, workers, and they begin building their own fort called Fort Duquesne. Washington has to deal with that. Well, the French know that he's coming, and they have a meeting south of what is today Uniontown, Pennsylvania, like on the West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania border. Personal story, my grandparents' house is like three miles from this spot. As a young boy, I would pedal my bike down the National Road 40, and I would crawl off into the woods. And I was determined that I would find a belt buckle, a bayonet, a rifle. I was going to find something. I found a lot of copperheads, and I found a lot of poison ivy and black blackberries. But I never found you know, a lot of old coke ovens and bricks, but I never found anything from the war. So I'm still mad about that. But anyway. Um, they meet um, French forces led by a guy named Jacques Jumonville. 
It's now called Jamonville Glen. And they meet, and while Washington is sitting with Jumonville, Half King and the Iroquois warriors charge into the camp, and somebody shoots Jumonville at point blank range. The French say Washington did it. He's like, man, I'm sitting there talking to him, and before I know it, shots are fired. He goes, Half King did it. And Washington said that because on the way, Jumonville was known as the village burner. And several Iroquois villages were destroyed. Half King thought it was him. So when Jamonville is killed, they have to wipe out pretty much the entire French detachment. Two guys get away. They scurry back down the Monongahela River, and they get to Pittsburgh. And they're like, dude, the British just fired. They probably didn't say dude, but they said something. And now an entire French army is coming after Washington. He's like, oh, man. There's no way I'm going to be able to get back east before they, they catch me. So he hastily builds what is known, I'll show you a picture in a minute, called Fort Necessity. Probably the absolute worst fort in American history. I mean, it is just like pieces of slab wood stuck in the middle of a field, and shockingly, it doesn't work. Well, after Fort Necessity, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, Washington is captured, but he is released. Look, we're going to do an investigation. You get out of here. And Washington is held captive until he signs a statement that he takes responsibility for the killing of Jumonville. And Washington kind of, oh, puts it off, puts it off, puts it off, until there's a pouring down rainstorm. And he begins to sign his name in, on it. But whoa, the paper fell in the mud and it got all wet. So he signed it. And he goes, you have to honor your word. You said you'd let me go if I signed the paper. like, well, we can't read this. He's like, well, it's not my fault you made me sign it in the rain. So a little bit of, of uh, good thinking there on Washington's part. Well, he leaves. And the British are mad at him. You can't sign that document. And he's like, well, what do you want me to do? They were going to kill us all, and you can't read my name anyway, so it's all um, propaganda. And so some people in the Americas say Washington showed bravery, he showed initiative, but he also showed his inexperience. You shouldn't have built a fort there, you should have made a run for it, and you should not have signed any document taking responsibility for anything. And this is going to kickstart a war that will literally have international consequences. England and France will fight in North America and in Europe because of Washington's actions in Jamonville Glen. So it's an international conflict. 1755, Washington is made senior aide to a British general named Braddock. And Braddock stares down his nose at colonials. And Washington's like, look, my dad knows Lord Fairfax, I was going to be educated. Yeah, okay. You know, whatever. And Washington badly wants a military rank from Braddock, but he doesn't get one. He says, no, those are for proper British only. I'll give you proper British only. But Washington is sent to help him march back to Pittsburgh and get the French out of Fort Duquesne. And on the way, Washington has a bout of malaria. He's really sick, high fevers, and the British are moving very slow. And he's like, look, we got to go faster. They're like, you look like you're going to die. He's like, yeah, I know that. But I'm willing to move faster. We can't take our time. We can't drag all of these supplies. And Braddock says, well, that's just what we do. He's like, you're not fighting in Europe. Where we're going, you can't take all this stuff. The French and their allies are going to be waiting for us. We have to move. Ha! Ah, piss posh, stupid colonist. And as they get closer, the French and the Indian allies, as Washington predicts, hammers the detachment. This is for necessity. It's literally planks of wood, like, pounded into the ground, and out front is a little ditch where the riflemen were supposed to lay by this cannon. Problem is, Washington didn't order the forest close by, cleared so they could see the Indians coming and the French, and they got right up on top of them and blew the police to pieces. 
the musket balls went right through the wood and they had no choice literally like a little ramshackle shack in the middle of the field and they're like really you made this too easy this, this isn't even hard so the British lose that one but as the French attack um, the regulars try and stand on the road and they're getting just massacred by the French and their Indian allies and Washington who's like you know coughing hacking up a lung says get into the woods don't stand here in the middle of the road you've got to engage them in the tree line and him and the colonial militia do and they're able to push back the left side of the French and Indian forces while the British on the right are standing in the middle of the road and they're getting massacred. So Washington rides over and says, spread out, get in the woods, pish posh, pish posh, cheer you, this is how we do it. And he's like, no, and you're all going to die. When Braddock tells the men to stand their ground, he turns with his sword and he's shot in the chest. Bullet goes through his right lung. Washington deathly ill catches him. Washington's horse is shot out from underneath him. He is strong enough to catch Braddock on the way down, gets on his horse, and pulls Braddock to safety. His staff comes by. Washington says, watch him. I'm going to go back and lead the troops into the woods. So Washington and the militia, Washington takes over the British regulars, and they push the French off the battlefield. But Braddock is dead. And so Washington says, look, he will be a large piece of propaganda. They dig a hole for Braddock. They place his body in it, throw the dirt on top of it. And then Washington has the entire British column march over it, hiding his grave. So we know close to where Braddock is, but we don't know exactly where Braddock is. And he continues forward and moves on. Because of his actions, Governor Dinwiddie makes Washington, when he returns victorious, head of America's full-time first America's first full-time military detachment. You are going to run all colonial troops in the state of Virginia. And through all this process, Washington is learning. Necessity was a horrible mistake. Having half king put his tomahawk through Jamonville. That was bad. You know, <laughs> slowness of foot, new tactics, you know, shining the paper. And so when he gets command, they said he's a total disciplinarian and he, you know, just hammers training. It's training, training, training for all types, from Indian War to French warfare to fighting the old Napoleon, what we know as the Napoleonic style, and getting into the woods going one on one. Prepare for every contingency. And he and his men will fight 20 different battles between French and Indian groups and in 10 months. So they're on the move all the time. And Washington wins most of them. And so if you look at histories of you know, Americans moving westward, the one colony where there are the fewest Native American attacks is in Virginia. And it's mostly due to Washington marching all around Plus, again, he scouted the terrain as a surveyor. He wanted to buy some land, and he really liked the Shenandoah Valley. So everywhere he went, he made sure the Indians were out of there, the people were protected, but he also got to pick the best choices of land. If he ever comes into money, he's going to start buying it up. So, 1758, Washington comes back east. And he resigns. He's like, you know, I've had enough of the military. I've done about everything I can. He does not enter the military again until the revolution. He's going to have about a 20-year break. Um, but while he's there, he talked to everybody. And he understands the military, the political, and he hones the leadership skills he's going to need to hold the army together during the Revolutionary War. He learns how to train an army, to drill an army, how to outfit an army, how to handle logistics, and best of all, he learns battlefield organization. And he's able to assess British strengths and weaknesses, how the British do things, why they do things, what they will do in a certain situation. He learns from the masters. At this time, Britain has the most powerful army on the planet. They haven't been defeated in a long time. 
So they're great to learn from. And he goes, well, a lot of that stuff is great and it's applicable, but sometimes over here you got to do things a little differently. So Washington's got all this. Now, everyone who said few things surprised them. Washington's size, he was just bigger than everybody. His strength and his stamina were legendary. There is a story of um, when he takes over the army in Massachusetts, a southern soldier and a New England soldier were arguing, and Washington rides up, and his horse leaps over a four-rail fence. They said he was a peerless rider. He lands between the two men, reaches down, picks them up, and bangs their head together and says, there will be no dissension in this army. We've got enough to worry about instead of fighting each other. Now, whether that's true or not, it's still... Something had to happen. Everyone is in awe of Washington. So they said it's his size and his strength are important, but what really sets him apart is when things are going to hell and, you know, there's chaos, he was as cool and calm. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. He was unfazed. And everyone followed his orders without question. He was just one of those guys that people were drawn to and they listened to. So now he makes... Probably his best decision of his life. Washington was lower to middle class. He really wanted to be somebody. He's a smart guy, energetic guy, but he needed an in in society. Now, he was very conscious of his teeth. We all know about his teeth. Um, they were not made of wood, right? They were ivory. Some were made from hippopotamus, which is still kind of gross, but it worked. But they said he was an excellent dancer. He could dance, you know, better than Michael Jackson. Yee <laughs> hee! <laughs> All right, so maybe not that good, but anyway. And so he would go on the social circuit, and all the pretty young ladies wanted to dance. Oh, George, George. But he was like, oh, here's a man. One lady he went after in particular, he saw her when he was back in the militia, a widowed lady by the name of Martha. And Martha had two children, and her husband had dead, was dead. She was very pretty. One thing that Martha had that really attracted Washington's eye is she was filthy rich. Washington is a good old-fashioned gold digger, all right? All right, we are going to marry up. And so he does. He marries Martha Park Custis, one of the richest people in Virginia. When he marries her, from land that he bought in Shenandoah, to what he inherits, at one time he will literally own most of the land from what is today Charleston, West Virginia, to the Potomac River. Right? So George is doing really well. All right? He is not a poor guy anymore. Now that he's got property, social standing, a connected wife, he has the reputation of a war hero, and he's a smart guy, let's not forget that, he is elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses for seven straight years. And one thing Washington hated was debt. He's got um, a mother-in-law or an aunt who owed some money. He sells some land, makes some money, pays it off. When he had to buy money or borrow money to, to purchase land or to get seed or cattle, he worked hard to pay it off right away. He hated debt. And so as he understands this, he goes, you know, tobacco's great, but what if it doesn't work? So if you've ever, anybody ever been to Mount Vernon? All right, the Mount Vernon tour is great. When you go down to his barn and you see like the super cows and stuff, well, he begins to breed different animals to be, you know, disease resistant, to be drought resistant. He's always working with plants. He diversifies his farm, begins to brew moonshine. All right, which they're starting to sell again between April and September. You can get some Washington recipe shine. And, you know, he's just always doing something. The little barn where, you know, he has the animals walk around in a circle and it knocks the, the wheat off the chaff. I mean, he's always doing something. He always has his hand in something to make money. He's a gentleman planner. But he starts to look at some things. And when the British start ramping up their taxes to pay for the French and Indian War that he started, he's like, you know, this just really doesn't work. And he asks that England 
receive representatives from the colonies to Parliament. He's like, it only makes sense. We, we're, they still consider themselves Englishmen. Let us have the say so. And when they don't, he begins to lead the resistance. He's one of the first to speak out against the Townsend Acts. And the Townsend Acts are some of the early taxes that go on, on like paper, ink, lead, glass, necessary items. Washington says, well, I make all those right here on my farm. Why do I got to send them to England, have them turn around and make a finished product that I have to buy at an inflated price? That's stupid. I'll make them in the shop right there. He's like, why do we have to do this if we're not going to get representation? And so he begins to argue, and finally those acts are repealed. 1769, he's more active, and he says what we need to do is stop imported goods from England. He's the very first to suggest that. We'll show them, we just won't buy their stuff. Washington regards the intolerable acts of 1774 of one of the worst things ever. The intolerable, intolerable acts are the ones we hear, it's the tax on sugar, it's the tea tax, and the stamp tax. He's like, this is crap. And he tells a good buddy of his, Richard Henry Lee, he goes, the British government has no more right to put their hand in my pockets and take my money than I have to reach into yours and steal your wallet. He goes, this is garbage. So one of the lead, uh, leading men outspoken against the taxes is George Washington. Whoops, did I get that? All right. All right, so 1774, he chairs the Fairfax Resolves in Virginia and is one of the first to call for a united Continental Congress. Let's bring all the colonies together. And people say, George, that's such a great idea. Since it was your idea, you're going as one of our delegates. Who else would you like to go with you? He's like, well, give me that Jefferson kid. He's pretty smart. A couple of these other guys. And we're going to go ahead and handle this. In the meantime, the battles of Lexington and Concord are fought up in Massachusetts. And Washington shows up the next summer in the Second Continental Congress wearing his old military uniform from his militia days. It still fits him. They're like, dude, George is wearing his military outfit. He said that he wanted to show the delegates that they need to be prepared for war. Everybody interprets him showing up as that he is vying to be the head of the Continental Army. He never lobbied for it, but when it comes time, people are saying, George is the man. George, and especially since Virginia was so big, so wealthy, and so powerful, and the northern states, especially John Adams from Massachusetts, knew that they needed southern <coughs> support, George is going to get this job. So he has made the commander-in-chief, a job that he's probably made, made for, but he did not solicit. So this time, England says, look, any military officer or any government official trying to secede from England will suffer repercussions. Your property can't be stolen. You are taken, confiscated, and you will be executed for treason. Now, one of the wealthiest men in America, whose land is point blank where one of the British landing points might be, is George Washington. Mount Vernon's right there. And he goes, you know what? Sometimes in order to be free, you got to risk it. So he lets it go. And it's here that no one probably did as a military commander for many, many years what Washington did. Again, he's facing the most feared army on the planet. At this time, this is the empire that England has on which the sun never sets. Somewhere in the world, the sun is shining on territory that England has imperialized. Everyone's terrified of their army. And here's this group of little ragtag colonists saying, yeah, we got this, all right? And here's George. He hasn't been in the military in 20 years. Number one, all right, he's got to lead the troops against the British, an undefeatable army. He's got to come up with a strategy of the war, how we're going to go about a large-scale defeating this massive armed force. 
While he's doing that, number two, he's got to organize an army, he's got to train an army, and he's got to equip an army that at this point doesn't really exist. And he's got to pick a command structure of guys that not only that can lead, that he can trust. One of them that he picks happens to be Benedict Arnold. And Arnold breaks Washington's heart. That's as bad for, for, for Benedict. And thirdly, because he's Washington, he's this known name, he's this big guy, he's this rich guy, he is the physical face, the physical embodiment of our revolution against the British. He is the symbol that we use for our resistance as George Washington. All this is on his shoulders. So he's got to keep Congress, he's got to keep the separate state militias, he's got to keep the people and the Continental Army focused on the goal which was defeating England. There's a lot of self-interest, a lot of me first, a lot of, we can't do that. A lot of, I'm not going to pay for that. Maybe we should just surrender. He's got to funnel and channel all of that and somehow pull off an upset victory. So, 1775, he goes up to Massachusetts and he takes, he hoodwinks um, General Howe, the British general, into thinking that he is going to attack from what is today Charleston, Massachusetts, and he takes cannons through the night around in a circle and puts them up on a hill overlooking the British fleet. And the British soldiers, some of them were living in Boston, but many lived on the troop ships. It's where all their supplies were, it's where all their weapons were, and from where Washington was, he commanded those heights. And when the British ships, um, excuse me, with that, British ships saw those, they had no force but to retreat. So he shows up and wins a victory right away. But the colonists say, you know, the one thing we don't have is gunpowder. Well, where are we going to get it? He's like, well, take it from the British. Well, can we do that? Well, yeah, all right. We're at war with them. They've got forts out west. They've got some in Canada and some down in the Caribbean. Send some ships to take it. Let's go up into Canada and raid their forts. Well, aren't they going to get mad? Yeah, and who cares? There's like four guys defending it. We need their stuff. Let's go get it. So, oh man, that's a great idea. Yes, I know. So they get all the gunpowder, they get some cannons, and the Continental Army has a little bit of strength for a while. Um, after the British evacuates, over in England, London Times begins to say stuff. So this guy, this guy Washington, right, we've heard about him. He was the Jamonville Glen guy. And they're saying that he is the one guy whose reputation is so well known, he's the one guy that could ruin the British Empire. This is all the way back in 1776. Same year, William Howe is going to launch a massive naval campaign. He's going to go after New York and Philadelphia. Washington meets him on Long Island. And this is the time, if you've watched, was that AMC special um, turn? It's great. Uh, all right, it's great. Washington creates this intricate spy network all, all over Long Island. This is when he does it. He's the only one who understands the code, and he picks certain people to disseminate it. And the big thing about Washington is that he didn't outfight the British, he outspied them. He, his spy network was so vast and so subtle, he knew everything that was going on. If you go back to the great, you know, um, Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu, he who has the most information in war is probably going to win. So Washington has all this, but he gets hammered on Long Island. Um, the Continental Army is just not up to snuff. The British are pounding them, beating them backward, backward, backward towards um, the city. Um, Washington has to retreat several times. We all know this. He almost gets caught. He's trapped on the East River when the wind currents suddenly shift, and he's able to get men across the East River into Manhattan and then, you know, over the um, Hudson River. He's one step ahead of the British, 
But man, it looks bad. All we're doing is losing. All we're doing is retreating. Congress was getting angry. We were lo excuse me, losing money. And then on Christmas night, 1776, he probably makes one of his biggest decisions, and that is to cross the Delaware River. We're going to go over into New Jersey, and we're going to catch the Hessians at Trent. And th there weren't enough boats. It was freezing cold. The river was full of ice. By the time they were ready to go, it was way late. It was brutal cold. And Washington says, no, if we lose this opportunity, we're going to lose the war. He makes it. And marching five to eight miles in the bitter cold, they arrive not at night as they had hoped, but when the sun was already up. Many of the German soldiers were sleeping in from the Christmas revelry, and we win our first big victory. A week later, we follow it up with a victory over British regulars in Princeton, New Jersey, and things are beginning to turn. The British Army retreats back into New York City, where they will stay for the rest of the war. They'll come, they'll kind of yo-yo in and out. But Washington pretty much boxes them in with two small victories early on in the war. The British come out and say, hey, you got lucky, but we're going to build up support in New York. Do you want to surrender? And Washington says, absolutely not. The only thing we'll negotiate for is our own independence. And he gives a quote. They say, you realize if we get our hands on you, George, we're going to hang you. And he's like, look, you know, I only have but one job. If you catch me, my life is a small sacrifice for the liberty of my countrymen. So if you can get me, go ahead and do it. I'm a willing sacrifice. You think they're mad now? Go ahead and hang me. All right, let's do this. But you got to catch me first. So, um, when we think about the battle of, or the crossing of the Delaware, there's that famous photo where, where Washington is foot up on the bow of this little like, boat. It wasn't, it was, a, it was a barge. It was a flat bottom barge with as many guys as we can get on it before the thing sinks. And it is Maine and Long Island fishermen who row these things back and forth eight times during the night, bringing the Continental Army over. Next big challenge Washington is going to face is the brutal winter at Valley Forge. We were talking last week how underrated Philadelphia is as a city to visit. Twelve miles outside is Valley Forge. You might as well see it if um, you ever go. Um, Washington, during this time, um, reorganizes the army. Um, there was a lot of desertion, but these victories put a stop to that. He increases pay and gives gifts. He rewards service. And he also increases punishments if you deserve. Or deserve. Yes, sir. Is the money coming from the Congress? Like how Supposedly coming from Congress, he fronts it and then asks to be reimbursed. Second thing he does is during the winter, he makes the entire army get inoculated for smallpox. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, look, I'm telling you, I had it many years ago, disease is almost worse than battle. So by the time he's done, smallpox deaths went from 17% of the deaths in the Continental Army down to 1%. He does it during winter um, encampment. Washington is always, always retreating. He'll fight a little battle. He'll back off. And what his plan is, whether you call it guerrilla warfare, Fabian tactics, draw the bigger, stronger British army away from their base of supply. It is what King Leonidas did way back at Thermopylae. Persian army is really big. They consume a lot of resources. When they run out, that's when we got them. Make them follow us, follow us, follow us, farther and farther away from their base of supply. 1977 is a big year. General Howe comes out of New York. He's headed towards Philadelphia. Another general, John Burgoyne, comes from Canada. He's coming down through New York. Washington takes his forces 
and hurls them at General Howe. He's defeated twice, once north of New York in Saratoga and once at a place called Germantown. He loses badly both times, but they're enough to scare General Howe back into New York City. His job was to link up with Burgoyne way up north coming out of Canada. When that doesn't happen, Burgoyne's army is destroyed by the mountain men of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So while Washington loses, he didn't try to lose, but he had to hammer Howe to keep them from linking up. So it's a gamble, a decision he makes that pays off. I lost a lot of guys, but the British are separated, and Howe is staying in New York City. So it goes down as a victory. During the rest of that winter, Washington will get help from Prussian, um, you know, the Baron von Manfred von Steuben, who can't speak English. Um, the only English words he can speak are cuss words. But he had a letter of introduction from Ben Franklin. And at Valley Forge, he teaches the militia in the freezing bitter cold how to be an army, stomping on their foot, screaming at him, yelling at him, cussing at him. They learn how to march. They learn how to fire and reload. They learn tactics. So in the spring, it's on. And in the spring, over the winter, Washington divided his leadership up between trusted aide Nathaniel Green. There are victories at Cowpens, down here at Kings Mountain, Guilford Courthouse, which is a loss, yet a victory. And Washington is still running circles around the British. Yes, he's getting beat, but they're coming farther and farther and farther into the United States, and the British are out of supplies. The victory at Saratoga, um, where he loses but wins, also convinces the French to come in on the side of the Americans. All right, what better way to get back at the British than by siding with America and the guy who started the French and Indian War and helped win it for them. So when it's all said and done, the British are trapped at Yorktown and victory is won. Several key decisions are made and through this all they said it was the personality of Washington, the decision making. Some people wanted him removed. They thought he was ineffective. Guys wanted to desert. At the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey, when Washington shows up on the front lines screaming and yelling and, and cussing, the Continental Army had their first test after Valley Forge, and they began to retreat, and Washington says, why are you retreating? Didn't we train for this? And he grabs a rifle off a soldier and rides forward by himself, and everyone says, oh, crap. If Washington's not afraid, then why should we? And we win our first toe-to-toe -to -toe victory in Monmouth because of uh, New Jersey, because of Washington. Side note there, I knew this was going to happen, I'm so sorry. There's a guy named Patrick Bulldog Ferguson, a Scottish guy. They actually try and portray him in that little turn series. He's the guy who buried out on King's Mountain. Well, he was a sniper. And he said at Monmouth, he was snoop, sneaking through the trees with his regiment, and he had a bead on an officer. And he was just about to pull the trigger when the guy turned around, started screaming, yelling, and hollering. He was on a big white horse. Um, and he goes, ah, it's, you know, ungentlemanly to shoot an officer in the back. After the battle, he realized the guy he almost shot was Washington. He goes, if I would have known 